A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem Bismillah Rahman Rahim Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh Welcome everybody to the third uh, of four sessions about our class on early Ottoman history and the rise of the Ottoman Empire, particularly as it relates to um, the Islamic institutions of the empire. Today what we're going to do inshallah is we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. Um, last week kind of ended on a bit of a supposedly a cliffhanger, right, with the Battle of Ankara in the year 1402, in which uh, Sultan Bayezid of the Ottoman Empire was defeated by Timur, the feared uh, Turco-Mongol ruler that ruled out of modern-day Uzbekistan, and it seemed like that would be the end of the Ottoman Empire, right? I mean, it was just a complete destruction of the Ottoman army, and then a parceling up and, and division of Ottoman lands. Obviously, if you're attending this class, I assume that you know the Ottoman Empire does not end in 1402. It still has a few hundred centuries left in it. But it seems like it has gone through the phases, especially what we talked about with regards to Ibn Khaldun. We mentioned him a little bit briefly last week, and we talked about him in depth on uh, uh, in the first session. Ibn Khaldun theorizes that every empire, every dynasty has a natural lifespan, which lasts around 100 years and it lasts about three generations. So you look at the Ottomans, it begins with Osman I in the year 1299-1300 approximately, we can't get an exact date on, on that. Uh, it goes to his son Orhan, it goes to his son Murad I, and then it goes to Bayezid, and now 1402, it's been 103 years, the empire is kaput. But there's a few things about the Ottomans that makes them really unique that helps bring the empire back together. But we'll, we'll talk about uh, that in, in just a few minutes. Right now, what we need to talk about is what's known as the Ottoman Interregnum, which is the years from 1402 to 1413, in which there essentially was no Ottoman Empire. After Timur defeats Bayezid, he divides up the Ottoman lands between Bayezid's four sons, right? And here we have Mehmet, Isa, Musa, and Suleiman, and they go to war with each other. Right? It is a period of civil war amongst the Ottomans. Now, something that's really important to note here, and this relates to the interregnum as well as later and uh, later Ottoman history, uh, the Turks tended to have a policy of not really dividing up um, or appointing successors. And this applies for the Ottomans as well as other Turkic dynasties, even going back to the pre-Islamic Turks. They just had this idea that you do not appoint one of your sons whether it is the oldest or whoever, as your successor. The idea is that once you die, if you are a uh, ruler, if you're a sultan or whatever, you allow your children to figure it out amongst themselves. Right? So in some cases, like for example, when uh, Osman I dies in uh, uh, 1331, his son Orhan takes power, but then Orhan gives his brother Ala ad -Din, uh, a special kind of role within the Ottoman state, right? So that can happen. But more often than not, there's going to be some kind of conflict between the brothers who are trying to succeed their father. Now, the reason why, uh, or one of the reasons that is cited for why the Turkic dynasties had traditionally acted this way is because if you just appoint your oldest son to be your successor, he may or may not be the most qualified to rule the empire, right? I mean, this is the way that Western monarchies tend to work, right, uh, or whatever Western monarchies uh, still exist, but usually it's the oldest son uh, in, in uh, places like England and, uh, you know, Spain, I believe still has a king and, and a few other countries, but the Turks just didn't do that. You let your kids fight amongst themselves. Whoever comes out on top, whoever defeats his brothers, then by virtue of defeating his, his brothers, he must be the most qualified, He's the one that can rally the army together. He is the one that is an effective general in the field. He is the one that can get the loyalty of uh, the viziers and the nobles. So it's kind of the system that they develop in order to, um, to maintain their power, to maintain the effectiveness of the Khanate, right? Or of the Sultanate or, or whatever it is. In fact, something that's really interesting is the Mamluks who we mentioned previously. They are a Turkic dynasty well, not really a dynasty as we talked about, but they're a Turkic Sultanate based in Cairo that when the Sultan dies, one of his slaves is kind of elected or appointed 
to be, be his successor. So it's never actually his sons, or very rarely was it the case that the Sultan's son is the one that takes power after him. Now, when the Ottomans go to war with the Mamluks, spoiler alert, sorry, uh, but that's coming. When the Ottomans go to war with the Mamluks, there is a very interesting figure in uh, Damascus. We actually know almost nothing about this person other than the fact that he left a uh, like a 30 or 40 page long um, uh, panegyric, basically talking about how great Sultan Selim is and how the Ottomans should conquer the Mamluks. And he says one of the reasons why the Mamluks don't have a right to power is, um, in his words, Nesahu ayat al mirath Right. He says that they have abrogated or gotten rid of the, um, the verses of inheritance. And he's like, these Mamluks, they don't allow their children to inherit the way that they should. They give power to somebody who's not even related to them. Whereas what they should do is what the Ottomans do, the old Turkic tradition of kind of letting them fight amongst uh, each other. In any case, that was the policy we're going to see. This is going to continue to be the policy um, for the Ottomans throughout the 15th and 16th centuries. Eventually, they do move to another system. In the time of Sultan Ahmed I, in the early 17th century, he says, you know what, this is really um, barbaric, and it's not uh, uh, feasible for us to continue to do this. So instead of going to war with my brothers, I'm just going to, you know, give them an apartment in the palace, essentially kind of imprison them. Uh, to make sure that they can't revolt against him. This is one of the, the recurring themes of Ottoman history. And it's really kind of a miracle that the Ottomans lasted as long as they did because of the number of wars that you have amongst brothers. And in some cases, um, you know, there's really not a lot of uh, potential successors that are left. So they were lucky that they had, you know, a, a, a son here and there to allow the line to, to continue. In any case, um, we have this war between the four brothers, Mehmet, Isa, Musa, and Suleiman. Long story short, Mehmet is the one that comes out on top. All right. Uh, Mehmet, by the way, is a uh, Turkified version of the name uh, Muhammad. I've heard one of the explanations for why uh, uh, Turks name their sons Mehmet instead of Muhammad is that uh, you know, if you're yelling at your son you know, for, for doing something wrong, or if your son does anything wrong in, in general, it's inappropriate for him to be called Muhammad, right? Like a Muhammad can't possibly be like an alcoholic or something like that, or you can't yell at your son Muhammad like you're such a horrible kid. So in order to, uh, to avoid having to, to mention the Prophet Sallallahu name in a negative uh, context, they would say Muhammad instead. I'm not sure if that's really accurate or not. It's probably more just a... Uh, mispronunciation. Now, a, a really interesting thing that, that uh, we need to appreciate here is we have four sons of Bayezid, Mehmet, Muhammad, as we said, Isa, Musa, and Sulaiman. Now, I've seen some history writers uh, mention the idea that Bayezid himself didn't, was not a religious Muslim. And the evidence that they offer up is they say, well, look at his sons. One is named after a, uh, the Muslim prophet Muhammad. One is named after the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, father of Christianity, supposedly, Isa, Jesus. And two are named after Jewish prophets, right? Musa and Suleiman. So they theorize that he probably was some kind of a pantheist or, or a, uh, a perennialist who believed in all religions and things like that. And that's obviously ludicrous. I mean, Muslims name their children after all the prophets regardless. That doesn't mean that they believe in Judaism or Christianity or whatever. But it also points to something that I think is really important for everybody to understand, which is that um, there in, ac in academic writing, there tends to be a bit of a divide between those who work on Ottoman history specifically and those who work on um, Islamic legal or intellectual history. Now, in order to study anything, really, you, you need to know the language, all right? So if anyone is interested in studying history, you can't do it just in English. Um, you have to know the target languages that you are studying, unless if you're studying something like, you know, American history. Obviously, you don't need to know any other language besides English, probably, uh, with perhaps some, ex some exceptions. But if you want to study Ottoman history, you need to know Turkish, and you need to know Ottoman Turkish specifically, which is 
the older version of modern Turkish that's written in the Arabic script. If you want to study Islamic intellectual history, you need to know Arabic. And not just you need to know Arabic like you've taken a couple classes in college. You need to really master that language. You really need to be able to read very complex works of law, of theology, of philosophy in order to understand the Islamic intellectual tradition. Now, both Turkish and Arabic are not easy languages to pick up. If you're an English speaker, both of those languages operate completely differently from English. So you're going to spend years picking up Arabic and years picking up Turkish. Now, the reality of grad schools in uh, the Western Academy is that you don't have that time, right? Usually you're there for, you know, five to 10 years on average for the most part. And your coursework will probably be three or four years, if that. In some cases, it might be as, as little as two. In that time, you're not going to become a master of Arabic and a master of Turkish. The result overall, and there are many exceptions to this, but I'm just mentioning kind of in general, a lot of writers of Ottoman history don't have a very good grasp of Arabic. And as a result, they don't have a very good grasp of Islamic intellectual history or just a, a good grasp of Islam in general. On the flip side, sometimes you have scholars of Islamic intellectual history, scholars of Islamic law, theology, et cetera, who don't really get the history of the Ottoman Empire very well because they can't read the sources in Turkish and in some cases in Persian to be able to really um, use those sources in an, in an effective manner. So you end up having some historians who will write things like Bayezid was probably a perennialist because his kids all had different uh, uh, prophetic names, which is totally ludicrous. Any Muslim with an elementary uh, uh, education in Islam would know that that's ludicrous. But we find that kind of stuff. And this is all just to, to, to say and to remind everybody that if you do want to study um, anything in the Western Academy, you have to tread very lightly. And even if you don't want to study in uh, an academic setting, if you just want to read books written by professors, just be aware of these things. These are nuances that you start to pick up after a while um, that are really important. And if you don't pick up on them, you end up really with some very strange uh, ideas. In any case, um, by the year eight, or sorry, uh, by the year 1413, we have the reestablishment of the Ottoman state under Mehmet I, Mehmet Chelebi. Uh, he defeats his brothers in battle. He takes uh, uh, power and he essentially redeclares himself as Sultan. Why is the empire able to rise out of its own ashes, whereas other states throughout Muslim history, like the Umayyads who we talked about uh, last week or, or the week before that, after a hundred years, that's pretty much the end of it. And it is really those three things that we talked about last week. Number one, it is the religious establishment, which is <clears throat> connected to the Ottoman state. The Ottomans are very um, insistent on establishing a, uh, a religious class that is connected to the ruling class. And we see this with Orhan's uh, establishment of the Madrasa in Iznik, which is the first, um, uh, the first case of an Ottoman state-sponsored school. We also have the Ahis, which are the guilds that we talked about. Uh, these are the things, and the, the Janissaries uh, being the third factor, these are the things that really, even after the Ottoman Empire falls apart, everybody is still kind of tied to this idea of Ottomanness. Right? They're still tied to the institutions that the Ottoman Empire uh, brings about in this land, which is very much the Wild West. And I'll, I'll bring up the uh, laser pointer here once again talked about the Ottomans kind of get their start around this uh, area known as Suut in Western Turkey. And the early Ottoman state is based in Western Anatolia. As we talked about, this is not a region that had ex known Islam really before the Ottomans come about. So the Ottomans are not taking over Damascus and Cairo and Baghdad yet. Those areas have a established tradition of how things run. The Ottomans here can do whatever they want, and they're establishing new institutions that allow them uh, uh, to build their power base on things like the Ottoman uh, intellect, uh, Ottoman uh, educational system, and et cetera, et cetera. So now after the uh, reestablishment of the state by 1413, most of Mehmet Chalabi's reign is spent just kind of reconquering some lands as the Ottomans have been in civil war now 
for uh, about a decade, they've lost a little bit of land to some of their neighbors, people that they had been at war previous with previously, as we saw with the reign of Bayezid. And even Murad II's reign, which is the son of Mehmed I. I mean, Mehmed I, we're not really going to talk that much about him. He's not as significant of a figure as some of the other people that we're going to talk about. Uh, but Murad II's reign is also focused mostly on reestablishing uh, Ottoman control over both lands in both Asia and in Europe. So you can see over here, you have the Bosphorus Strait and the Dardanelles over here, which separates the continent of Asia over here, where we have Anatolia, and the European continent over here. We're looking at the Balkans, so modern day countries uh, like Bulgaria, Albania, uh, Bosnia, Serbia, uh, Romania, etc. Now, there is a major battle that we should talk about, which occurs in the year 1444, between a united crusade of, um, of Polish, Hungarian, and Wallachian troops that uh, is known as the Varna Crusade, which comes and tries to destroy the Ottoman Empire. This is not the first example of a crusade that is aimed at the Ottomans. Murad II, long story short, defeats that crusade and really establishes a very firm Ottoman uh, line of control in the Balkans. Now, after he does that, he actually gives up power. He says that he has no interest in being a sultan anymore, and he abdicates. And this is very strange in Ottoman history. This doesn't happen very often. Uh, there's only a few cases, at least in the first couple hundred years of Ottoman history, where a sultan doesn't rule all the way up until his death. Now, he abdicates in favor of his son, Mehmet. Uh, and Mehmet is only like 12 years old at this point. So you can imagine, obviously, they had a very different notion of adulthood compared to what we have today. The idea of you become an adult at the age of 18 is a modern concept. In pre-modern societies, you're an adult as soon as you are uh, you know, physically uh, 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 mature, right? Especially in, in an agrarian type society, people who live on farms and things like that, you know, your kid who's 13, 14 years old, he's going to work in the fields right alongside you, right? Put that energy to good use. There's no such thing as high school back in the day. So being 12, 13, 14 years old, you're not really a child anymore, but he's still very young. And he inherits his father's advisors, right? A sultan never obviously rules on his own. He has people that work with him that take on different uh, roles within the government, people who are in charge of finance, people who are in charge of military, people who are uh, in charge of foreign relations, etc. just like any country today has uh, a cabinet. So when Mehmet comes to power, he's surrounded by people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and he's 12 years old, and he's supposedly their boss. The amount of control that he actually exercised over his court was very, very little. They really did not respect him. He was a kid. And from a lot of accounts that we have at that time, he really wasn't even, uh, you know, the, the most easygoing kid uh, uh, to deal with. So you can imagine his advisors really didn't care much for him. He had a lot of trouble actually kind of keeping them under control. And sources differ on this, but it seems like uh, what happened is he is overthrown by his own grand vizier, Halil Pasha, who sends him back to go be a prince again and brings back Murad II. Um, so this really is a stain on the early reign of Mehmet the, the, the Second because he comes to power, he rules for a couple of years, nobody is actually respecting him. Even other countries are preparing another crusade because they're like, well, there's a 12 year old on the throne. We can take advantage of this. He's not going to be able to lead the army. So Mehmet is sent back uh, to, to go be a governor of a, of a province and, uh, and away from, from the court for a while. We'll talk uh, in a few minutes about what he does in the second time that he comes to power. But before that, we need to talk about one of the things that Sultan Murad II does that is really, really important and really sets the stage for the Ottomans operating in a very different way compared to pretty much every other um, state uh, uh, in Muslim history up until this point. So in the year 1425, he appoints somebody by the name of Mullah Shamsuddin Fenari as the Ottoman Mufti, right? Now, a little bit of background on Mullah Fenari. He was a scholar that was born in the city of Bursa. He studied under his father, who was also a scholar, as well as a few of the other scholars um, in Bursa and in Western Anatolia. 
And then he goes uh, to Hajj and he stops in Egypt. And in Egypt, he meets a lot of the scholars and studies under a lot of the scholars of Cairo, notably Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who, if you know anything about Islamic intellectual history, he's really one of the most important figures in the post-classical era. Now, he spends a lot of time in Egypt studying under those scholars. He gets some uh, uh, certificates kind of of completion of having studied under Ibn Hajar or Ibn Hajar gets some from him, depending on who you ask. And he goes back to uh, Bursa. This is under the reign of Bayezid still. So this is in the late 1300s. And he's appointed as a, uh, uh, a leader of a madrasa in Bursa after Timur dis, uh, destroys the Ottomans in 1402. Fenari goes to Karamanolu, which is another Turkish Beylik uh, centered in Konya. Fenari spent some time there. Eventually in 1425, he's called back by Murad II. Murad II tells him, we're going to give you your old job back. You're going to be in charge of the Madrasa of Bursa, but we're also going to appoint you as Mufti. Now, this is weird because while Muftis have existed right, throughout Muslim history, being appointed by a government as a mufti is something that has never happened before. And in order, in order to appreciate why this is important, we need to understand the difference between a mufti and a qadi. All right. So a qadi is a state-appointed judge. The same way that every country in the world has judges. In the United States, we have judges that are either appointed or in some cases elected. Europe has judges. These are people that you go to if you have a court case. Right. So if you uh, have a dispute with your neighbor over, you know, where the property line ends, right, which is important for farming communities, you go to a judge and that judge has the power of the state behind him. So whatever the judge says is the final word. And if you do not go by the ruling of the judge, the ruling of the Qadi, you can be in trouble with the state. Right. So this applies for things like uh, personal law. Um, as well as cases of uh, criminal law. So if you have a divorce case, for example, you go to a qadi, right? If there's dispute between a husband and a wife over, you know, the exact terms of their uh, marriage contract, and now that they want to get divorced, they have to, to, to lay out uh, some stipulations and things like that. It is the qadi that you go to, right? Similarly, if somebody is a criminal, the um, authority of the state is exercised through the qadi. And this is a position that has existed throughout Muslim history, right? Imam Abu Hanifa's two uh, students, uh, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani and uh, Qadi Abu Yusuf, both of them served as Qadis in uh, the Abbasid Empire. But the Mufti is a different thing altogether. A Mufti is simply somebody who issues a opinion on a religious matter. And this is a non-binding opinion. A mufti is not somebody who is employed by the state. So if you have a question about anything that has to pertain to the deen, you can go to a mufti. That question can be something as innocuous as, you know, uh, 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 what is the fatwa on taking out a loan from a bank or whatever? Or it could be something that has to do with, you know, property rights and things like that. In many cases, what a qadi would do is a qadi when he has a court case in front of him, calls in a mufti and asks him to rule on a hypothetical situation. So if that generally is not something where a mufti is ruling on a particular case, they usually generalize these cases. And they'll say, um, hypothetically, if there was a Zaid who lived next door to somebody by the name of Amr, the names are, uh, these names are standardized. It's not referring to a particular Zaid and Amr. They say, well, and Zaid happens to do X, Y, Z, and then Amr's response is this. Hypothetically, in a situation like that, then, you know, whatever, this is what I would do. The Qadi would take that information and add it to the pile of evidence, right? So a Mufti's job, as it relates to a Qadi, is essentially to offer religious opinions. Now, on a personal level, these religious opinions are non-binding meaning that if you do not follow them, that doesn't really mean anything. Now, disclaimer, if you go to a mufti today and you say something like, you know, do I actually have to pray Salat al-Duhr? Uh, and the mufti says, yes, 
yeah, it's not binding in that, you know, the state isn't going to come after you, you know, President Trump isn't going to tell you, you know, you need to pray Salat al or anything like that. Um, it, but it's still a, a fatwa from the Islamic religious tradition. You should, you should still obviously take it very seriously. But the Mufti has never been part of the state apparatus until now, until Murad appoints Shamsuddin Fanari as the state Mufti. Now, this position is later going to evolve into something known as the Sheikh al Islam. Uh, Sheikh al Islam is obviously a title that's uh, used throughout Muslim history for different people. But in the Ottoman context, it's a very specific office. It's basically the Grand Mufti, the Mufti of Istanbul, later after the Ottomans conquer uh, the city of Istanbul. So what we have to appreciate here is that the Ottomans, they do something different. They innovate with regards to the establishment of a new um, position in the government known as the Mufti. And we still see this today in lands that were once ruled by the Ottoman Empire. If you go to the Arab lands, if you go to Egypt, if you go to Syria, if you go to uh, Jordan or uh, even the Balkans and Turkey, you're still going to find people appointed by the governments as muftis. So, so you'll have a mufti, for example, of Damascus, a mufti of Sarajevo, a mufti of um, even small towns, a mufti for an entire country, like in the case of Egypt, for example. In the rest of the Muslim world, a mufti is not a state appointed position. It is simply somebody who has studied enough to be able to issue fatawa that are responsible, right? Somebody who has studied a uh, longer course of study than your average um, a graduate. What the Ottomans, however, do is because they have these state appointed muftis, it is both a, they have a mufti of Istanbul who is the grand mufti as well as regional muftis, as well as even individual city muftis. They are now able to start to churn out a ton of fatawa. People send questions to the capital saying, all right, well, I have this particular case right now. I don't know what to do. I want some kind of religious opinion. Qadis are sending these uh, questions uh, to the capital. And the Sheikh al Islam now takes these, he generalizes them, replaces the names with Zayd and Amr, and they would publish these. We have even today, you can go and uh, most, not a lot of them have been translated from Turkish, but we have a lot of books that are compilations of fatawa. And the point of this was to try to standardize the uh, fatawa that are issued throughout the empire. It was an attempt to really kind of make sure that everybody's on the same footing, especially as, you know, looking back at this map here, the Ottoman Empire is growing. It's no longer this Wild West kind of uh, 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 Beylik. This is really now starting to become a sultanate. It's really starting to become an empire. I wouldn't say that it's an empire until they conquer the city of Constantinople right here, which we'll talk about in a minute. But we're getting there. And if you have a large empire, you need some kind of standardization of the law, right? So for example, uh, the classical example that's always given with regards to uh, uh, plurality of fatawa in the Ottoman context, the Ottomans, and going back to this map over here, are right on the Mediterranean Sea. There's a lot of sailors. Now, if you uh, are a woman who her husband goes out on a boat, and you just never see him again. You don't know what happened to him. He very well might have gotten shipwrecked and died. Maybe he just ran away from you and doesn't want to see you anymore. You don't know what happened, right? Uh, you just know that he got on a boat and you never saw him again. You might go to a mufti and he's going to say, uh, and because you want an annulment of your marriage, you want to get remarried, right? You're saying, I assume my husband is probably dead. I need some kind of uh, ability to, to get married to somebody else. You might go to a mufti that's going to say, well, my interpretation of the sources says that you need to wait until you are certain that he is dead. Either you get some kind of confirmation from somebody that saw him die, or if, he's, if he was 40 years old, perhaps when he left, and uh, it's been five years, you know, if he just ran away, he's probably still alive, which means your marriage is still uh, 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 valid. So you need to wait another you know, 50, 60 years until he would have been like 110 years old. And then you know for sure that he's dead. And then you can get remarried, which is kind of really not practical. On the flip side, another mufti from another madhab might say, okay, well, a five-year period has passed or a 10-year period has passed. You know, uh, This person either ran away from you, in which case you would really intend divorce anyways, or he died. Either way, your marriage is now over. You can get married to somebody else. That's the example that's very often used um, with regards to uh, 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 
uh, Fatawa in the Ottoman Empire. So what the Ottomans tried to do is they tried to standardize Fatawa by writing these essentially fatwa manuals where they send them out throughout the empire so that Qadis already, they don't have to consult individual muftis. They say, well, the grand mufti has given this fatwa. So that's going to serve as uh, a piece of evidence for uh, this particular court case. The Ottomans are unique in this. Nobody else in history does this. Later, however, uh, the Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb Alamgiri, uh, he actually brings together, this is much later in the late 1600s, early 1700s. He brings together hundreds of ulama in, uh, in India. I mean, they're from across the Muslim world, but they congregate in India where they write a huge compilation of fatawa known as the Fatawa al-Alamgiriya or the Fatawa al-Hindiya, which kind of seems to operate much like Ottoman fatawa. But otherwise, we really don't have any cases of people using muftis and fatawa in this way. And that really is an Ottoman innovation. I don't mean innovation in a negative sense here at all. I mean this in a very positive sense. This is what allows the Ottomans to be as powerful and as standardized as they are. All of this is part of the standardization of the religious establishment, which is known as the Aimiyya, right? This is the establishment of uh, the state-appointed mufti. It's the establishment of state-run schools the establishment of a state mandated curriculum. Next week, inshallah, we're gonna talk about how uh, during the reign of Sultan Suleiman in the mid 17th century, or sorry, mid 16th century, they actually have a, uh, a firman, a, a royal decree from the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman saying which books you have to study as a essentially the equivalent of a graduate student in religious studies. You have to have studied this book, you have to be able to access this dictionary. You have to, you know, have studied this one with a with a scholar. If you do that, then you can graduate essentially and become a great scholar. Um, now, another thing that's really important before we move on, and we are going to get back to Mehmet II and the conquest of Constantinople uh, in just a minute. But one of the things that's really important to note is Mullah Shamsuddin Fanari, right? This great jurist. He writes a very important book of Islamic legal theory known as uh, Fusul al-Bada'ir. He is also a huge Sufi in that he is a huge supporter of Ibn Arabi. Going back to what we talked about last week and the week before that, Ibn Arabi has a huge impact on the early, I mean, not just the early Ottoman state, but the entire Ottoman empire. The first um, Ottoman uh, madrasa is established for Dawud, Dawud al-Qaisari in the 1330s by Sultan Orhan. Dawud al-Qaisari was uh, a huge proponent of Ibn Arabi. He was a student of Kashani, who was a student of Ibn Arabi. Shamsuddin Fanari writes a commentary on Sadr al al-Qunawi's commentary on, uh, on Fusus, which is a book of Ibn Arabi. I mean, Fanari is really one of the big supporters of Ibn Arabi early on in, uh, in Ottoman history. Now, I'm talking about standardization of the religious establishment and things like that, but it's important to note that Tasawwuf was never standardized and brought under the, uh, the uh, umbrella of the Ilmiya. And in order to appreciate this, we need to kind of step back. We have to take a look at Hadith Jibreel, which I assume everybody is perhaps uh, familiar with. If you're not, you should certainly should be um, watching Sheikh Amin's uh, uh, classes on Risal al on Thursday nights. But uh, in Hadith Jibreel, we have a tripartite division of the Islamic sciences, right? In which uh, Angel Jibreel asked Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan? And the Prophet responds with the five pillars, uh, as we know them, the six pillars of uh, belief and Ihsan being to, to worship Allah as if you can see him and if you can't, uh, then recognize that that he sees you. So from this, we have a division of the Islamic sciences into three. When Angel Jibreel asks about Islam, right, and the Prophet responds with the five pillars, these are things that we do. This roughly corresponds with fiqh, right? This corresponds with bodily actions, right? How do you pray? How do you fast? How do you uh, do hajj, etc.? When he asks about iman, this corresponds with aqidah and the science of kalam, right? Kalam being a subset of the science of aqidah. This deals with belief. This is the domain of the mind. And when he, when he asks about ihsan, this is about spirituality. This is the, the domain of the heart, right? So the first two, Islam and Iman, fiqh and aqidah, are certainly part of the religious establishment. 
by necessity in that if you are, uh, you know, the, the, the Mufti, your job essentially is to, to rule on Islamic law, right? It's, it's to rule on fiqh. Um, these two sciences are taught in the schools, right? They're part of the curriculum. You study books of fiqh, you study books of aqidah and kalam. Tasawwuf, the science of spirituality, the science of ihsan is not under the umbrella of the ilmiyyah. That is something that is on its own, essentially. There are tariqas, turuq, uh, that exist throughout the Muslim world, always have. Um, again, for references, go back and, and watch uh, Sheikh Min's lectures uh, on, on this and to get a really good uh, detailed historical understanding of, of the development of tariqas in, in Muslim history. But in the Ottoman context, you have tons of tariqas, but they are ne none of them are ever standardized as like, this is the Ottoman tariqa. The way that fiqh and certain books and certain uh, 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 muftis are in the Ottoman context. But the state still recognizes the importance of tasawwuf and recognizes the authority of the Sufis. And that's why Shamsuddin Fanadi is appointed as somebody who deals with fiqh, but he is known primarily as uh, a commentator on Ibn Arabi. And he's known as somebody who is a master of the spiritual sciences. So the marriage of Tasawwuf with the Ottoman state, again, we see this with the beginning of the Ottoman state with Osman and his Sheikh uh, Edebali. And we see this late throughout Ottoman history from the beginning all the way to the end. <clears throat> now, let's talk about Mehmet II. All right, we now are, what are we, six, seven sultans in? We go from... Osman, Orhan, Murad, Bayezid, Mehmet I, Murad II, and now Mehmet II, he comes to power a second time in the year 1451. At this point, he's 19 years old. Now his father has died. All right, at this point, it's not like, you know, we can bring Murad back. Mehmet II comes to power, he's 19 years old. Those same advisors that overthrew him a few years earlier, they're still there. And they still don't like him. All right, he's still relatively young. I mean, he's older, he's, he's a full-fledged adult, even by our standards, at the age of 19. But both the people in the court and even soldiers in the army, even tradesmen in the markets, they're looking at him and saying, well, this guy's not really going to be a very effective sultan. He's been overthrown once before, he can be overthrown again. He doesn't seem to be a very effective ruler. Now, if you are Mehmed and you want to prove your... Uh, ability to rule. You want to prove that I'm no joke. You better take me seriously. What can you do? You can conquer the city of Constantinople, right? Here we have a image of the Hagia Sophia, uh, which actually this building is very old. This building was standing when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, obviously without the minarets. Those are added after Muhammad's time. It was initially a Christian cathedral. This was the apple of the world. Now at the time of Muhammad, the city is nowhere near uh, the metropolis that it had been previously. It had been uh, destroyed by crusaders and really uh, as Byzantine Roman land uh, shrunk and the Byzantine empire really kind of became a non-factor, the wealth of that city was just completely destroyed. But it still has this uh, huge importance as a symbol and not the least of which because of the famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he says, Indeed, you will conquer Constantinople, Constantinia, uh, the way that it is in Arabic and Turkish. Um, and the, what a wonderful uh, ruler that will be and what a wonderful army that will be. So this is why the city of Constantinople has a huge kind of target on its back throughout Muslim history. Because, you know, unless if you're a Sahabi of the Prophet wasallam, you don't really have a hadith about, that mentions you, right? We have hadith in which the Prophet talks about people that are around him. But if you were, you know, not born at that time and you were never a companion of the Prophet, there's nothing that mentions you. Unless if you can conquer the city of Constantinople, then you are mentioned by this hadith. That hadith is about you if you happen to be that Amir, that, that ruler, or you happen to be part of that army. For this reason, we talked about previously, the Umayyads tried to besiege the city. They were unsuccessful. Bayezid, the first, tried to conquer the city. He was unsuccessful. Mehmet's father, Murad, tried to, to besiege it. He was also unsuccessful. So even though the city is no longer as powerful as it once was, the Byzantine Empire is nothing like what it used to be, 
it's still a prize, right? This is just kind of taking a look at what is the, the political situation of that time. I mean, th this purple land over here, we have a little bit of land over here in the Peloponnesian Peninsula, as well as the land around Constantinople, that's all that's left of the Byzantine Empire. In fact, it's a misnomer to even refer to it as an empire at this point. It's really a city state. So how come the Ottomans, how come Bayezid, how come Murad were unable to conquer it? This is why, all right? Take a look. If you happen to ever go to Istanbul, um, you will see these walls if you go to the old city. They are enormous. Obviously, these have been rebuilt and, and you know, you can even see in this image uh, what's original and, and what's new. But I mean, these walls are, are absolutely huge. They're actually, you can't really see it in this image, but it's three layers of walls. The first wall itself being, you know, what you would normally consider like a castle wall. The second wall being even bigger than that, and there's a big moat kind of uh, in between. And then the third essentially being a huge impenetrable fortress. And then when you look at a map of the city of Constantinople, you can understand why it is so impossible to conquer the city. It's a peninsula, right? Surrounded on three sides by water over here in the Golden Horn, the Bosphorus Strait, and the Sea of Marmara. And then this image that I just showed you of the walls, that's on the land side over here. These are known as the Theodosian walls. These were built by uh, a Byzantine emperor by the name of Theodosius in uh, the sixth century. And they've stood ever since. And even around uh, the coast, there's a wall, right? Not as big as the, the Theodosian wall, but even today, if you go to Istanbul and you're on, there's uh, a few motorways that go right along the coast, you're gonna see this wall, it's all the way and it's, it's survived for over a thousand years. So, this is why the Ottomans are, are unable to ever conquer it. What Mehmet does is he says, this is going to be the first thing that I'm going to do. He's 19 years old. The first things uh, that he does in the first few months of his reign is he gets the army ready. He hires uh, the best engineers that he can to engineer the biggest and best cannons that he can find. Um, that's the, really the thing that allows the conquest of Constantinople. If you don't have cannons in the pre-modern era, you're going to get nowhere near conquering these walls. That's impossible. However, in the 15th century, suddenly we have cannon technology coming over from China uh, that is now being experimented with, both by Muslim, civilization, uh, Muslim states and Muslim civilizations, as well as Europeans. And we'll talk a little bit about Al-Andalus uh, in a few minutes. Um, the Castilians and the, uh, uh, of uh, the late 15th century, they actually use cannons to help take out the last uh, remnants of Muslim rule in southern Spain. So by the year 1453, he's actually able to amass an army that's over 100,000 people. They've got tons of giant cannons. You can go on uh, on Google and just, you know, search up uh, some of the cannons of the siege of Constantinople. They're, they're enormous. They're the biggest things that have ever, ever been built for that purpose up till that point in human history. Long story short, I really don't want to bore everybody with the details, and it's really not as important for, um, for our context here. The Ottomans besieged the city for a few months in the spring of 1453. Really, it's about a month and a half. At the very end of that, they are able to storm the city, and they conquer it from the Byzantines, and that is the end of the Byzantine Empire, right? The Byzantine Empire, as we talked about previously, this is the same empire as the Roman Empire. Right? And they refer to themselves as the Romans. They don't call themselves Byzantines. Uh, the final Byzantine emperor, the final Roman emperor is killed in the battle. And Mehmet takes the city. He actually appoints himself. He declares himself Qaisari Rum, the Caesar of Rome. Uh, but nobody takes that title seriously. Um, and even his own son, Bayezid, doesn't really do much with that title uh, after Mehmet's death. For this reason, as we talked about previously, most Ottoman sultans have a nickname. The nickname for Mehmet II is Fatih, right? He is the conqueror because not only of his conquest of the city of uh, Constantinople, but also his conquest of land in modern day Greece, modern day Serbia. Uh, and even he sent an army across the Adriatic to conquer the old city of Rome, the real Rome. But that was sent just a few months before he died. And when he died, that army came back uh, to Istanbul. Now, one thing also that I want to, to mention just kind of as a side note, uh, today, obviously, we refer to the city of Constantinople as Istanbul. 
the name officially changed actually in the 1920s. Throughout the Ottoman era, it was still known officially as Constantinia. The name Istanbul actually does come from Greek, right? There's a misnomer out there that says that it's uh, short for Islambul, like city of Islam or full of Islam and things like that. There's really no evidence that that is actually the case. There are a few coins that are minted in the 18th century, I believe, in which it is referred to as Islambul. Uh, but there's no etymology for that. This actually comes from Greek. Istanpolis means to the city. So it was very kind of popularly known as, uh, as the city and, and, and people going to the city. Um, so in any case, Mehmet conquers the city of Constantinople. He conquers a lot of land in the Balkans. He is known as Fatih. He's known as the conqueror. After he dies in the year 1481, we have his son Bayezid taking power. And remember what I said at the beginning of today's lesson about um, the Turkish pattern of succession. You don't appoint any of your children as your successor. You let them fight it out. So when Mehmet dies, Bayezid declares himself Sultan, but his brother Jem does not accept this. And Jem actually leads a rebellion against his brother. There is a very lengthy, very uh, disastrous civil, civil war between Bayezid and Jem. Jem actually ends up escaping down to the Mamluk realms down here in uh, Cairo. And he actually tries to use the Mamluks to uh, mount an army against his brother and uh, conquer the Ottoman Empire from him. Because of that, Bayezid's reign, we do not see any kind of major conquests. All right, Nothing like what was seen during the reign of his father in the conquest of Constantinople and lands in the Balkans. In fact, even um, Jem at the very end of his life, uh, if I recall correctly, ends up even going to Rome and seeking help from European countries trying to conquer the Ottoman Empire. And Jem's children and grandchildren later also try to become sultans of the Ottoman Empire. None of them are ever successful. But it's important to note that this uh, uh, this civil war really hampers the Ottoman Empire for a few hundred, for a few decades, not a few hundred years. But one thing that is really notable about Bayezid's reign, he reigns from uh, 1481 until the first decade of the uh, 16th century. He is the Ottoman Sultan during the fall of Granada in Muslim Spain. If you know anything about uh, the history of Muslim Spain. I mean, that could be another course in and of itself. I mean, that's that's a really fascinating uh, story and, and history there that's totally separate from everything that's going on here. But in the year 1451, actually, to be precise, January 1st, 1451, the city of Granada is handed over from the last Muslim rulers of Al Andalus, the um, uh, uh, the ruler uh, Muhammad the Twelfth to the Castilians uh, and the king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella. Now, uh, 1492, another thing important that happens is obviously, as we know, Columbus sails the ocean blue. That's the nursery rhyme that everybody learns, perhaps, I don't know if any anymore, but certainly when I was a kid, we learned in 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. The wealth that he gets in order to be able to finance that mission is taken from the uh, Castilian conquest of Granada. Right, Granada, even though it was a fairly small emirate in the southern part of Spain, was fairly wealthy, and the conquest of it by Castile and Aragon does allow them to finance Columbus, and he was there at the surrender of Granada in 1492. In any case, after, uh, or I should say part of the surrender of Granada was that the Castilians, who later we now know as the Spanish, they have to promise the Muslims that they are going to give them their religious freedom. That Muslims are going to continue to be able to live in Granada and throughout the rest of uh, Castile and Aragon unharassed. We know that that's not going to continue by the uh, about a decade after the fall of Granada they actually ban Islam but in 1492 itself Judaism is banned. Right there's a ton of Jews in fact some of the most important Jewish philosophers most notably Maimonides, Musa ibn Maimun, um, are from Muslim Spain, right? And this is something that you find throughout Muslim history is that, uh, I mean, I don't need to emphasize this, perhaps everybody already knows this, but just to be thorough, uh, Christians and Jews are, as you know, allowed to live in Muslim lands and, and in many cases thrive in ways that they never could in Europe. 
um, for hundreds of years. And, and the Jews of, of Muslim Spain are an example of that. Now, in 1492, when Ferdinand and Isabella conquer Granada, they immediately ban Judaism. So they tell all the Jews, you absolutely have to leave or you need to convert to Christianity. And this is the beginnings of what is known as the Spanish Inquisition. Bayezid actually issues a sultanic order saying any Jews that are leaving Muslim Spain are to be welcomed in our lands. And we have huge Jewish communities, particularly in the city of uh, Constantinople in Istanbul, as well as in Salonika, which is now in uh, northeastern Greece. Uh, and this is a really notable thing because it actually allows the Ottoman Empire to, uh, to benefit from this greatly. He supposedly says how wonderful a king Ferdinand is. He, um, he impoverishes his own kingdom uh, and allows mine to thrive because the Jews were known to be very uh, effective uh, in pretty much any industry they took part in. So he actually welcomed them. Now, the, a question that's very often brought up is why didn't the Ottomans do anything about uh, the Muslims in Spain and uh, the fact that they are conquered by Castile and Aragon and then later persecuted and not allowed to practice their religion. It's very easy for us, you know, hundreds of years later to look back and say, you know, the Ottomans should have done this or why didn't they send a navy to go and conquer them. Spain is very far away, right? And the Ottomans still are not really a world empire. They're certainly a regional empire. After Mehmet II, I would say that this is when we can properly call it an empire. But Spain is hundreds of miles away across the Mediterranean Sea. There's no way that the Ottomans can mount a defense of Muslim lands that far away. And we even see this um, in the next century, in the 16th century, when the, um, the, the Indian Ocean is being conquered by the Portuguese. Right? The Portuguese land in Yemen, they land in Oman, they land in India. And very notably, they land in Southeast Asia in what's now Indonesia and Malaysia. The Ottomans are able to send a couple admirals and a few ships, but they're not able to do everything. Similarly, in the case of Muslim Spain, the Ottomans are very well aware of what's going on, but they are unable to, uh, to push back against the Castilians and, uh, uh, and the Aragonese. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about today, setting up the scene for next week, is taking a look at what's happening over here in the east. Now, this was the center of Timur's empire at the turn of the 15th century. Timur dies not long after the Battle of Ankara in 1402, and his empire kind of disintegrates. The Timurids are no longer really much of a factor. And this area is ruled by a number of different uh, dynasties, people like the Akkoyunlu and the Karakoyunlu. But starting in the late 1400s and the beginning and the early 1500s, we have a figure by the name of Shah Ismail that comes to power. Now, Shah Ismail comes from a Turkic family known as the Safavids. And a few generations before Shah Ismail himself, the Safavids convert to Shiism and they start engaging in some very strange, very uh, heterodox, we can say, uh, messianic beliefs. Even by Shi'i standards, the things that they're saying are really kind of far out there to the point that by the time of Shah Ismail, he's declaring himself to be a manifestation of the divine on earth. I mean, it's really kind of far out there. But what he does is he's able to conquer all of what we now consider Iran, right? All of Persia through a combination of Shi'i messianism as well as Persian nationalism or proto-Persian nationalism. It's really not the nationalism that we, that we have today, especially because Shah Ismail himself is not Persian. He is actually a Turk. But they establish now a major empire that is based on Shiism. And they are, they are able to kind of um, excite or perhaps kind of motivate uh, elements within Anatolia, within Ottoman lands over here to start to rebel against the Ottoman Sultan, Bayezid at this point. Now, Bayezid, his personality seems to be a very kind of toned down one. He didn't seem to be, from our sources, he doesn't really seem to be somebody that's interested in going to war uh, with people. And in fact, his own son, Selim, really gets very frustrated with him. And Bayezid does abdicate. 
a lot of evidence seems to point that Selim kind of forced him to abdicate. Selim, his son, kind of pushes him out of the way to assume the throne himself because he's really worried about the Safavids. This is a new dynasty that's showing up in Iran that seems to have this messianic belief that they're going to conquer the entire world. So this is naturally kind of shaping up to be a showdown between the Ottomans who are going to kind of take on this new role as the defenders of uh, Sunni Islam against the Shi'i Safavids. Now, if you've ever been wondering why Iran is Shi'i and you look at Muslim history, we have you know, countless scholars uh, who are Persian, who are mainstream Sunni traditional Muslims. Uh, the most notable obviously being uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, right? He was a Persian. Imam Ghazali was a Persian. The Most of the compilers of Hadith, people like Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, those guys were Persian as well. When did they become Shi'i? It happens at the beginning of the Safavid era. It is during the reign of Shah Ismail that they really forced the entire population into Shi'ism. They force people to start uh, cursing the first three khulafa. They start bringing in uh, Shi'i ulama from uh, Iraq and uh, Lebanon in particular, which have been traditional centers of Shi'i learning. Before this point, 12 or Shi'ism at least, what we sometimes refer to as uh, Ja'fari Shi'ism, had never been a political force. Uh, previously, I, I think we mentioned the Fatimids, they were a political force, but they were not Jafari, Twelve or Shi'is. Those guys were Ismailis, which is a totally different branch of Shi'ism. Now, however, Twelve or Shi'ism is becoming a problem for the Ottomans. And there's a lot of uh, uh, kind of border, border clashes between the Ottomans and the Safavids. And when Selim takes power in 1510, that's when we really are now going to see a major showdown between the Ottomans and the Safavids. And this showdown is directly going to lead to the Ottomans going from being a regional empire to becoming the major empire of the world at that time in the 16th century, uh, setting up the stage for his son, Suleiman, who really rules over what we can call the golden age of the Ottoman Empire. Really, I really, in general, don't like uh, the term golden age because it's a bit simplistic, but you know we can make an exception in that case. Uh, in any case, Jazakumullah uh, khair for uh, attending this class. Uh, once again, we're leaving on a bit of a cliffhanger, uh, but you know that, that's a good way to, to make sure that everybody shows up for the, uh, for the last session next week, inshallah. And a reminder, inshallah, if you are attending this class and not the others, uh, with uh, notably Sheikh Amin, as well as uh, Maulana Bilal Ansari and uh, Sheikh Hamza Mahbul, you certainly should be attending those as well, especially Sheikh Amin. It really gives you a lot of the foundation that will help you understand why is tasawwuf so important, uh, which will even help you understand a bit of Ottoman history. So Jazakumullah uh, khair, inshallah, I will see you all next week for our last session. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah.